Okay, today we're going to talk a little bit about the ISIS Distributed Computing System. It's a tool for building highly available cloud computing solutions. And through this and the other modules that uh, we'll be looking at, we'll be able to learn to build ISIS applications, uh, to understand the design choices and trade-offs that you have to make, and uh, to understand some of the pragmatic challenges of actually getting the system to run in the setting where you'd like to put it. So the ISIS technology uh, is the latest in a series of generations of high assurance cloud computing systems we've built here at Cornell University. It's pre-built, it takes the form of a library, meaning uh, it's something you're going to link to a piece of software. Uh, there's a second way of using ISIS through command line uh, applications and uh, through a very, very skinny library that we've been building. We'll talk about that separately, but I'm going to be focused in this and the associated modules on using the ISIS library from a program you would write in C Sharp, C++, but the version uh, we'll be talking about is called C++ CLI. It's a Microsoft version, or Iron Python, which is a version of Python that runs on .NET. Uh, these are Windows technologies that also run on Linux using Mono. It's open source. You can download uh, the ISIS system from isis2.codeplex.com, and if you make enhancements or fix bugs, we'll be happy to incorporate them back into the system. Of course, it lacks commercial support, but these days that's not necessarily a terrible thing. So the library uh, is based on a model that I'll be telling you a bit about that merges two theoretically rigorous approaches to distributed computing. One is called virtual synchrony, and the other is called the dynamic uh, version of the Paxos state machine model. They're quite powerful. There's a strong mathematical background for them. We can prove things about these kinds of protocols. And by embodying them into this kind of a library, you're able to use them without having to rebuild them from scratch. And the goal is to make it easy for you to get highly effective, but also very strongly assured applications with a minimal amount of, of hassle. The kinds of properties that ISIS orients itself around and is optimized against include elasticity, where you're on a cloud platform, for example, and you have to vary the number of members of a service, but you'd like the members to behave consistently. Coordination of response to different types of demands, including load changes, but also just coordinated actions uh, when uh, an infrastructure acts on the real world. We have to also overcome cloud type issues like uh, scheduling delays, bursting message loss, um, and uh, we have to do all of that with good scaling and responsiveness. So this is quite a challenge. The community has been quite skeptical about whether it's feasible, but as you're going to see and hopefully experience, it's really not that hard to do with the right tools in your hands. And here at Cornell, uh, with many years of experience building such tools, uh, we think that we've created an infrastructure uh, and that it's become really pretty mature that can lead you to good solutions. So the main library, as I mentioned, is written in C-sharp. And I'll be using C-sharp for my examples. If you know Java but don't know C-sharp, you'll find the transition really is pretty easy. Uh, and if you work in other languages, C++ is the one that's easiest to use with ISIS. And I think Iron Python is quite viable. Um, you can move those applications uh, from Windows to uh, Mono, and you can actually do development on Mono if you prefer to do that. A lot of our experiments are really done on Mono. There isn't a particular advantage to Windows versus Mono, uh, but I happen to like Windows for development, and that's the examples I'll use in these videos. And I hope that won't confuse you if you're not a Windows developer. Um, but really, the tools are very analogous to, for example, the Mono, to, mono editing and debugging environment. If you do decide to work with Mono, you won't need root access, but you will need to install the Mono package on your system and point uh, the library uh, headers to it so that uh, we can compile our code. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, ISIS has an, what we're calling kind of an outboard motion, a model where you can use commands uh, in Linux or Windows to talk to it. Uh, I'll talk about that separately, but you won't hear about that in this set of modules. Um, but it's quite nice, and in fact, we're hoping that over time, Hadoop and HDFS users might come to uh, benefit from the ISIS functionality through those command interfaces. So uh, why use ISIS? It's, it's the latest in a, a long series of systems we've been building here at Cornell University that try to embody high assurance techniques into small 
tightly pa bound up packages that are mathematically robust. We really try to analyze them, in fact, sometimes using their improving tools, and at the same time are engineered to perform extremely well under cloudy conditions. We've had a lot of success with this. Uh, an early version of ISIS built almost 15 years ago now by me uh, was uh, used ultimately and still is used in the uh, French European and European air traffic control system. Uh, in uh, the New York Stock Exchange, where it ran the stock exchange trading floor for more than a decade. There were plenty of failures during that period of time, but ISIS helped them orchestrate a kind of seamless self-repair, U.S. Navy Aegis. There were all sorts of chemical plants, telecommunications switching systems that used ISIS. It's a very powerful system and quite popular. We built other systems after that here at Cornell. Uh, we built a system called Horus, which was the son of ISIS. Ensemble, which was uh, a rebuild of Horus in a high-level programming language. This new version of system, uh, calling it ISIS-2, or ISIS-squared, depending on my mood. But this new version of ISIS uh, is really a, a revisiting of those old, older ideas, but repackaged and rethought to integrate them tightly with environments like C-sharp and the Windows development setting .NET. Um, so it's our best, our best solution. I should say, uh, I kind of prefer to call it ISIS-2. The ISIS squared business is a kind of reference to uh, Amazon using EC2, S3. How could you outdo that? I came up with ISIS squared, but then I decided it was an inside joke. So you know what the joke is, but call it ISIS2. Um, and what does it do? Uh, as I said, it's a library, and uh, the purpose of using this library is to be able to build resilient, secure, consistent services that run at multiple locations, often in a data center. It might be a cloud data center like EC2. It could be your private cluster. It could actually be developed and even executed on your personal machine, but I'm not sure you would get that much value out of it in that setting. And uh, this group of programs share data and coordinate their actions. And ISIS is a specialist on those coordination and consistency uh, tasks. So I want to talk about the key concept in the system, which is data replication, and later we're going to dive in in other modules and look really carefully at how this works. So you have to imagine that you have a collection of machines. They're running on some kind of a platform, and you've installed things. You've uh, made holes in firewalls, if that's a necessity, which it often is. Uh, if you're a Linux user, you've adjusted IP tables to let our packets route from machine to machine. And what we have is a set of programs that can talk to each other. And what ISIS is going to do is it's going to automate doing that for you so that with very simple system calls, you can get this kind of powerful functionality. And we'll say the data is replicated if a set of programs share it. So here we have an example. We've got a fellow who's using some kind of a computer system, and perhaps this person is working on an iPad, some other kind of a client system, a desktop, and talking over the network to a cloud platform, or perhaps the application is, is a sensor, or, or some other kind of a, of a monitor of the real world, a video camera. I'm showing it as a person. And he talks to, to a service, and when, when his request is finally received in the service, that might be the first place where we focus on using ISIS. So ISIS um, could live in lots of different settings, but generally, it's used by applications hosted on a cluster or a cloud. And in the, these modules, I'll focus on that case. So in a traditional cloud setting, you'd have a picture like the one we have here, where the user would issue some kind of a request, either through a browser or perhaps an application program using web services, where you can do remote procedure calls, but they're handled through web pages, and it looks just like a browser technology under the wire, under the surface. And then computing occurs on behalf of that user. Maybe we look something up in a database, check to see if his wine cellar has the bottle of wine he's looking for, or maybe we're adjusting parameters for somebody's medical prescriptions, and that could be a doctor in a doctor's office. You can imagine lots of scenarios. And then a reply comes back. So that would be your typical cloud-hosted web service. And with ISIS hat, what we're doing is we're going to have that service peering with counterpart services which are replicated across the cloud. And the idea here is that they share data. That could be in-memory data, maybe just a table or a list. Many of my examples will be of that form. Or it could be a fancier thing, like they could be monitoring and managing a database. And maybe they even have multiple replicas of that database. But for this slide set, let's assume that they're managing data that's in-memory. And each one of these programs has its own private copy of that in-memory data. And our goal is going to be to keep those copies consistent. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we had to update the data in response to this fellow's request, 
we want all of the copies to get updated. And how are we going to keep them consistent? We're going to apply the same updates in the same order. And that will be an example of something ISIS does for you, although we'll see it does many other things that you need to worry about in this setting too. And so now I'll just comment that whereas before the delay before you could respond to the client was entirely local to that first green execution timeline from top to bottom being from when the request arrived to when a reply was sent, now we've got this additional delay associated with updating the other copies. And you can see that in the picture. So although there's a group of programs, I want you to notice that the programs didn't directly share memory or have any other special magic way to have access to replicated data. It's getting replicated by the fact that they joined this group and sent each other messages. ISIS is a very mechanical kind of thing in that sense. You have to send the messages and then process them by applying them to your data. You'll also have noticed that uh, although there's a group of programs, the client still is talking to one representative. Now, if we had thousands of clients, they might be load balanced across the group of four, but each individual client is talking to one representative, and so if the request needs to affect the whole group, it has to be relayed out in some kind of a fault-tolerant way, and you'd have to program that, although it's not hard to do with ISIS. Okay, so there's not a lot of magic occurring in this picture, and I'm hoping that people will understand that you're going to be looking at a relatively normal programming style, just like when you've built a GUI with Java or C Sharp in a class or in a, in a, you know, a product you might have been building. It's going to be handled through event call, up calls, uh, just like with a mouse handler where someone clicks on something. These are normal looking programs. We just happen to run them four or five, a thousand times and they coordinate what they're doing through explicit message interactions. They cooperate to replicate the data. I'm emphasizing that because I've discovered that many of my students here at Cornell start out a little confused because they imagine that this must be some completely different way of programming, but the right way to understand it is it's a completely standard way of programming in which a program has some extra functionality and while it's running it can say, join me up with my other colleagues get me a copy of the state of the system right now. I'd like to update this variable, share this update with the others. That's the way to think about ISIS. And it's doing those steps for you and we'll show you some of them. So let's step back and think about how to use ISIS to build an application. And the first step turns out to be to draw a picture on the whiteboard. Um, I, I find that many people try to program maybe by copying an example before they've really thought through what they want to do. In these big cloud environments where you're going to have a lot of moving parts at the end of the day, it really pays off to draw a picture and think it through kind of in, in, in a kind of brainstorming style before you ever code anything. So you've seen the kind of picture I have in mind. We have a client system and functionality we might put there. You could think about caching data there, how that client interacts with the external world a service that the client interacts with. What, what part of your state needs to be in the service? What part should be in the client? Uh, you may have to think about how you're going to control the network between them. ISIS doesn't provide that much help at that level, although we do have some functionality here at Cornell that could help you with that. Uh, I won't talk about it in this module. Um, there may be data files or databases that the service needs access to, and you should draw a little picture of those too. And if you do, think about whether there's one file that's shared among the, say, four or ten or a thousand service copies, or are there private copies, lots of them, one each? Makes a difference in how we design our application. All right, so let's continue with our application from before. So now we, we've drawn a picture like this, and what we'd like to do is to start to extend it into a service group. And now we should think a little bit about the functionality that needs to be provided for this to work. So one as aspect is what you've seen before. In ISIS, we're going to provide you with what's called multicast functionality, which is a way for one member of a group, and it really could be any member of the group, to send an event to the other members who all process the event in the same order. And you can see in this case, two multicasts are done. Other kinds of functionality involved setting up the group, launching the programs in the first place, getting the members initialized, dealing with all of them failing. There are a lot of other things we're going to think through as well. Um, you have to ask yourself where you're going to run, in fact, because depending on where you're going to situate your ISIS application, you can actually end up with rather different design decisions because costs vary, uh, and I mean computational costs, but also actual dollar costs. And, and uh, I'll give an example. On EC2, which is a very common choice, 
the cheapest configuration of EC2 involves running an application in what's called the soft tier uh, layer of EC2. But when those applications, which these are the, 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 the two cents an hour uh, ephemeral machines, when those applications shut down, nothing is stored. Even the local files on the local file system are discarded. Uh, if you do work there, all your state has to be stored somewhere else in the global file system, the S3 file system. In contrast, you can spend more money and have an instance of a real virtual machine, and when it shuts down, it'll be saved, and when it restarts, it'll be in the same state as before. But it costs you a lot more money. And so an interesting question to be thinking about is, do you want to spend less but have uh, less uh, functionality and less guarantees, or do you want to spend more uh, but is that extra expense paying off for you? Think about how people will connect to this service too. Now, um, I recommend that the next step be to build a non-replicated version of your service, a first instance that doesn't have any ISIS functionality at all, but just interacts with the client in the correct way. Get that working and debug it so that when you start working with ISIS, you're already in possession of a correct C-sharp program if you use C-sharp that can take requests from the client. It, that doesn't have to be the full functionality, but get the basics working so that you don't complicate your life by trying to learn to do two different things simultaneously. Um, planning ahead and knowing that you're going to use a library in C-sharp can argue that that's the moment to bite the bullet and learn a little bit about C-sharp and try to do a development in C-sharp so that when you get to the stage of using ISIS, it's easy to drop it in. Some people get stuck at this stage, I should say, because the fact is that, that working with the cloud involves steps you've probably never gone down before. Uh, renting virtual machines. If you're using Visual Studio, you have to tell it that you're creating a web service and then a web client. All of these are steps ISIS has nothing to do with. This just has to do with learning a style of computing. What I'll tell you is that uh, I've been programming in this field now for 35 years, and I was a little afraid to learn these new technologies myself. It's easy as a professor to sort of lock into one lifestyle. It doesn't necessarily mean learning the new stuff. But I forced myself to learn these technologies, and it's really very easy to use them. Things have never been easier to pick up and use. And so the biggest obstacle, I think, is just breaking through, making yourself a cup of coffee, and say, today I'm going to try to get something to say, hello world. So do that first. Now, if you already know C or C++, you may be saying, why do I have to learn C Sharp? If you're a Java user, why can't I just do it in Java? Well, I'm sorry that I didn't build ISIS in Java. Uh, I picked C Sharp because uh, I teach uh, Java, actually, but C Sharp takes Java as its starting point and cleans up some things which I've always found irritating about Java, uh, adds a bunch of very powerful functionality that I've ended up finding quite useful to use, and embeds it in a better programming environment as well. Eclipse, for all its wonders, is really a, a, a kind of primitive environment in some ways. And I like Visual Studio. So um, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to sell you on Microsoft technologies, but I will say that for me coming uh, into this kind of a development for the fifth or sixth time over my career, um, these, these have been the most productive tools and environments that I've worked with yet. Uh, and I definitely recommend uh, learning them. They're pretty easy to pick up and start to use because so much of what you need to know is just online and you can cut and paste or copy what other people have done. If you know Java, you're going to find a few days of work and you'll be comfortable in C Sharp. It's not going to surprise you in negative ways very often. Uh, so now you're ready to start to think about the replicated functionality of your application. You have to ask yourself what needs to be replicated. So one thing to understand about ISIS is that we're not going to just blindly replicate the whole program. That's not the way we think about it. What we do instead is we ask ourselves, which data in this program should I replicate? Then we can ask, how can we get that replication to be most efficient, and how can we guarantee that the properties, consistency, security, and other properties are aligned with the needs of my application? A medical treatment system might have very strong guarantees. Something that's monitoring traffic on a city street might have rather weak ones. And so depending on what we're trying to do, we'll have design choices down the, down the road. But the place to start, the first design choice, is you started with a single program. And now what you're going to do is look at that program and say, which objects within this program need to be shared across the application and which can be kept local? And that distinction of things I share and things that are local starts you thinking about the notion of an object group, a process group, we call it, um, where information is replicated. Um, and ISIS is oriented around that type of thinking and model. 
you can also do computation that is split across the different members, which could be just as simple as saying my updates will be fully replicated, my reads will be load balanced, or it could be more sophisticated in which you'll say a request comes in with, say, an image, and I'd like to search like an immense database and I want a thousand computers to search in parallel each doing different parts and I want to make sure that every image in the database was checked against the image I just got. Different models lead to different designs but ISIS is really designed to support all of these kinds of design choices. Um, it's helpful to think in terms of what people call a state machine and, and, and in particular a distributed state machine and that means just what it sounds like. So a state machine of course is some kind of a program where events trigger state transitions and we move through a sequence of states and these programs that we're writing with ISIS very often look like state machines in the sense that you wrote them in, in, in C Sharp but what causes their state to change are events and an event might be a request from an external client, a photo from a camera that, that you're monitoring a detection of movement at a motion detector. It could be any kind of an event. And then internally, when we turn around and replicate data, for example, the update becomes an event that everybody processes. Um, when you join a group or restart a group after total failure, you load in a checkpoint. ISIS presents that to you as a type of an event. One event is, can you please make me a checkpoint? And it's, a, it's delivered as a request to you. An event handler receives it. You make, you make your checkpoint, and on the other machine that was joining or restarting from start, that checkpoint arrives as a series of load checkpoint events. Everything is event-driven in this kind of a model. And what we mean by state machine is, is that the group that's replicated, because remember, we're not replicating the whole program, we're replicating data within it. But the replicated data sees the same events in the same order, it started in the same state, or at the time you joined, you got the state that the others were in, and because you apply the same events in the same order, you stay in the same state. And that's the whole idea. So here's the picture that we've seen before. You've seen this one a couple of times now, but now you're hopefully starting to understand what this picture really is about. So you can see that we have here four, in this particular case, four instances of this program running. But they're normal programs that look just like regular code, multi-threaded code as it turns out. But you don't have to use multi-threading very aggressively. I do, I should warn you. ISIS itself is heavily multi-threaded, but your code can be pretty much single-threaded. And here a request came in, and as you can see in this particular case, either we sent an update to the other copies, or perhaps what this picture is showing us is sending a parallel query to do a distributed lookup. And ISIS will support those kinds of models. And the group that we've written here, service group, now we understand that that's a kind of an entity in ISIS, uh, and I'll show you how you create one of those. And in this particular example, maybe we chose to host it on EC2. And as it's drawn here as a picture, it doesn't look like this particular group uses external databases or files. But I will comment that generally when I draw these pictures, any information that's local to a process, including files in the local file system on that node, I usually don't bother to draw pictures of those. When I do draw pictures, it's usually because I'm showing you an entity external to the program, like a MySQL database that might not even be running on the same computer. I usually, in my pictures, limit myself to sort of big functional blocks that are independent of each other, and I draw these sort of timeline pictures for things, even if they are a program and its local files. It's a good way to design things. Now, from this picture, we can start to be much more concrete. Uh, you can start to ask, how am I going to repl replicate state? What, how am I going to represent it? How am I going to update it? When will I copy it? How will those checkpoints be created? Uh, how will I deal with replying to my external client? Maybe I don't want to reply until I'm absolutely sure that the group has received and, and is going to keep the request. Maybe I'm more in a hurry and I send a reply, a reply as fast as I can and, and sacrifice other properties. We have these design choices that come up. Uh, and in this set of MOOC modules, we're going to go through those choices and look at exactly how ISIS makes them. So let's replicate a group um, and some data. And to do that, we're going we're to push a little bit deeper on this same scenario. So we have access to some kind of client server technology, like Visual Studio may be used to build a visual application that talks to a server. Um, and now we're going to have this question of, of how to replicate data. And I thought I might start by asking, how would you do this if you had to do it by yourself without help from ISIS? Well, you'd start by saying, I'm going to need a list of who the other group members are, because if an update is supposed to affect the other members, I have to know who to send it to. 
right? Then once an update occurs, you can run down that list and send those guys updates. So if you did replication version zero, that blue oval would be your list of other members. I don't know where you got it from. Uh, and these members are running. And now when a request comes in, maybe, maybe we had some variable that the programs all have, call it x, maybe its value was five. You can see we could perhaps set x to x plus 150. That's what we're doing here. And you would run down your list of other members and send them some form of, of operation and they would do the update. Now, if you were doing this, you'd have to keep track of that group membership because suppose members join while they're running, how did they find out that X is currently 5 at the beginning or that it was 155 at the end? The joining member has to be given the correct version of the current state, right? So that would be one issue. Just keeping track of who's in the group would be important because if some members think the group is A, B, and C and others think that no, D, E, and F are included, you could get pretty inconsistent behavior because some will send updates to D, D, E, and F, and some won't. And D, E, and F, they're going to they're get way out of sync. And then if you tried to send a request to the whole group, you could get chaotic responses. How would you even detect whether somebody has failed? Because on the cloud, delays are very, very common. So just say, well, if I don't get a response in three seconds, believe me, you'll often not get a response in three seconds. You'd probably go and read the literature, and you'd find papers by Leslie Lamport, Dahlia Malky, Robert Van Renesse, and you'd find many of my papers. And these papers were, you know, 30 or 40 years of work as we in the research community struggled to try to understand how to solve these problems really well. And there are more and more of them as you make your way down into the details of this. When you handle reliability, hey, wait a minute, we should design security from the ground up. How are we going to do that? So what's happening with a system like ISIS is that we recognize through experience that this has become quite hard and that by now today there are good stories for almost all of these things but if somebody doesn't package them up for you the chances of a developer who has an application in mind using the cutting edge story is really very low and so that's why we came into this saying to ourselves you know the thing to do here is to build a package make it open source put our version of the best of breed stories in the best is, uh, in this case, is sometimes stuff we develop. Sometimes, actually, ISIS is using techniques that other people developed and that I brought into my system. And by providing it to you for free, you have an easy way to pick this stuff up and build your own high assurance solution without having to solve all those problems from scratch, which would take you, you know, a while. Probably not the 30 or 35 years it's taken those of us who have been in the field the whole time, because you can read our papers, but you'd, you'd work on it for a while. This version of ISIS took me more than three years to build, by the way, and I built it myself, so if I was a team, it could have been done faster. But, you know, even with that, it would be a multi-year effort. So let's talk a little more about consistency. I've used the term. What I'm trying to say about consistency here, the key idea, is that replicated data is consistent. If we can talk to any of the different copies, any of the different replicas, well, we get the same answer as if we were talking just to one service that had one copy. That's a basic idea. So in some sense, if data is consistent, you can't really tell how many replicas there are because it's acting like a single service would have acted. And if data is inconsistent, two or three people can talk to it at the same time and they'd say, hey, uh, I was using eBay to do this, uh, this great auction and here was the series of bids and I won the product. And your friend might say, that's weird. I was in that auction, but that wasn't the series of bids. You see, that would be an inconsistency. We might agree at the end of the day that neither of us bought the product, it was bought by somebody else. But, but it would be inconsistent if your friend said, no, the bid order and the bids were this set, and you said, but that's not right. Two of those bids weren't there, you're missing one, and the order was different. Those were all examples of consistency. So if we go back to our data replication scenario, we could ask, what does consistency mean for this? And we can see that uh, it would typically arise, well, it already arose in some sense over this question of who's in the group in the first place. If this group should have had four members, or if it really has three, we were inconsistent right at the very first step when we sent the update to four. But setting that to the side, uh, consistency also arises if there are concurrent events occurring. Like in, in eBay, if two people are bidding on the same thing, uh, or in this example, we've got somebody trying to set X to X plus 150. I don't know what that means. Uh, maybe raise the bid by 150. And we have somebody else setting X to 22. I'm bidding 22. I guess if this was eBay, they're going to lose. But you can see that, that these are con, con, inconsistent in the sense that if you process these events in, the, in different orders at the different copies, you leave X in different states. 
right? So everybody had better do blue, red, or red, blue, and everybody had better do both red and blue, or both blue and red, uh, or they're going to end up in an inconsistent state. Look at how many, how many things ISIS has to worry about here, who everybody is, what order things are done in, whether they're alive or failed. You can see why it's building up to being a fairly substantial effort. Here's an example of an inconsistency in this particular picture, the way I drew it. One guy ends up with X at 155, but the others have X at 22, and it's because one guy did red-blue, but the others did blue-red. And ISIS won't let that happen. It automatically puts things in the correct order, uh, unless you actually tell it to not use uh, a fixed ordering, which you can do if you're sure about that. So inconsistency can come. If you see it, think about it this way, from many sources. Updates could reach members in different orders. A message could get dropped and not be transmitted again. The sender might fail while sending the updates. That's a hard case, actually. What you have to do in that situation is buffer them and retransmit them so that if, if I send you an update and I crash before I send my friend Harry an update, you turn around and send Harry the update. And you've got to build the software logic to do that. Membership. And all of this is hidden inside the ISIS library for you but otherwise you would have had to do it yourself. Um, and failure handling gets very subtle. Let me show you a thing that we call split brain syndrome. And this arises when we don't agree on who's in the group. I alluded to the problem a few minutes ago. So with split brains, imagine you have a group that has, I don't know, four or five members, enough members so that you could, you could split the group in half. Is that a big deal? Now, why might that happen? If you're using, say, TCP to connect to members, you might say, well, if a TCP connection breaks, that means the destination failed, but it doesn't always mean that. Sometimes the network itself can have a disruption that causes these TCP connections to fail. Same is true if you use UDP, you get timeouts. And an example of a disruption that can cause that would be somebody briefly unplugs an Ethernet wire in the data center, but then they plug it back in again. All the TCP connections will break, and when they plug it back in again, you have to re-establish them, and otherwise all the apps that were running over that connection see a connection failure. And if they interpret that to mean that the program at the other end failed, the kind of case that I'm going to show you now can arise. So here was uh, one of the very worst movies ever made, but it illustrates the idea because it's one of the very worst things that can happen to a service you're building. Um, what we say is that if a network becomes partitioned, that it creates split brain problems. And by brain, what I'm thinking of here is that your service is playing a kind of brainy role for some kind of an application. I've worked on air traffic control systems. Maybe the service is telling the air traffic controllers if it's safe for two planes to fly into some place. And of course, one it's safe for them, and the other should circle or something and fly into that spot later, like if you're trying to have planes line up to land in the Paris airport. Okay. Well, if you have confusion over which programs constitute the service, maybe one application, maybe it's the application in front of one air traffic controller, thinks A and B constitute the service, and somebody else thinks C and D constitute the service, you can easily imagine that one asks A and B, is it safe to fly into the spot, and A and B say sure. And if somebody else asks C and D, there's no obvious reason why they're talking to each other. And in a case with split brain, they're not talking to each other. A and B don't realize C and D are up, and C and D don't realize A and B are up. Now, who should be in charge? Right? So with split brain syndrome, you do really, really bad things. And they can be very, very dangerous. In the kinds of applications I've worked on in the past, very often you're working with things that are considered safety critical, life critical at least mission critical, and in fact, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, even normal enterprises, companies doing human records, uh, resources, and billing, and sending out tax receipts, they also have applications which it would be really serious if split brain occurs. Hypothetically, someone doesn't get their bonus, but the system says they were paid, or they get the wrong bonus, or they get two bonuses. I guess they wouldn't complain about that. So you see, you can map that down to our group computing setting. Here's split brain scenario in our group, right? And if we have these kinds of problems, it's very important that the underlying system resolve them. So that's another example of something a system like ISIS has to worry about. I'll tell you really quickly how it does that. 
under the surface it has a notion of a majority and it's got a thing it calls the membership oracle the oracle for short but called the membership oracle it's running inside some of the application programs. so your program when it's using isis might also have the membership oracle running in it we only run it on a few of the copies of the program but there'll be typically there'll be three or five of them running three is very typical you can have as few as one but then you won't get a guarantee in this case so let's say three running what happens is that if the oracle changes membership suddenly it always requires that there be a majority of the previous membership in order to keep running correctly uh, obviously you're thinking to yourself what if there were two and it drops to one isis has to be configured whether you want that to continue running or not and the idea here is that you can only have one majority, right? So below two, you wouldn't be able to make progress. But if you made sure the Oracle had a, a bunch of members, or you disable this feature, but then you'll, you'll get errors. So if you made sure the Oracle had enough members, you can say, well, only the majority can continue running. And that way, ISIS would be able to say the blue nodes remain alive, but the pink nodes lost the majority and can't run. And that's actually how ISIS will turn out to solve this problem. There have been other people who have solved this problem in slightly different ways using quorums, the famous Paxos protocols that Leslie Lamport did that you may have read about. They use quorums at this level. Actually, ISIS itself really does use quorums at this level unless you disable that feature. Um, but anybody who would build a solution to this kind of problem would have to solve that kind of, of issue, and it would be, have to be built way into the low levels of their system. Lots of systems need consistency. So I've mentioned a few. Medical computing systems need consistency. Stock exchanges do. Um, lately, here at Cornell University, we're involved in an effort to build software to, to make uh, the smart power grid smart, to host the smart applications. Uh, those systems need consistency so that the uh, power grid controllers, who are human beings who, who manage the large-scale power grid, so that they can do consistent things even when one group of controllers is in Ohio and another group is in Bedford, Massachusetts or something. Self-driving vehicles, we hear quite a lot about Google self-driving vehicles. Those vehicles take a lot of information from the cloud. The cloud-hosted services talking to the cars need to offer them consistent information. Uh, control systems for chemical plants, but as I said, even payroll and human resources, you name it, uh, and it turns out you find needs. Now, we struggle in this area against the problem that trade-offs are intrinsic. So this is a picture of Eric Brewer, counterpart of mine. He's a professor at Berkeley, quite well known. And Eric pointed out that at the end of the day, you almost always have trade-offs. The famous theorem that everyone attributes to him is called the CAP theorem. Uh, he actually posed it as a, a more of a, a, a premise or a conjecture, and then it was proved for a certain setting by people at MIT. But what CAP says is that you can have at most two out of three of consistency, and we've been talking about that, availability, which means when I ask my service a question, I get a prompt answer, and partition tolerance, which means it keeps running when the network partitions. Um, and normally, it turns out, in today's cloud, if you use an app on your iPhone or something, you're seeing a service that relaxes consistency to guarantee all, uh, all the time availability even during partition tolerance, which uh, partitions, which might mean that, say, Amazon's East Coast data center is currently unable to talk to its Portland data center for some reason. So they always gives you availability in modern cloud applications. And, and in fact, this is sort of a general belief that the cloud has to have weak consistency. What we're going to see is that with tools like ISIS, that's not really true. And it's not just ISIS that can confer this kind of guarantee. I could tell you about quite a few other such tools. Zookeeper is famous. Google has written a bunch of papers on something called Spanner, which is a large-scale consistent database system that they've been working with. And Google's Bigtable has consistency guarantees. Um, the Hadoop uh, and MapReduce systems have strong consistency. But for most applications that people build that run sort of in the scenario I showed you with a client and a service and they do quick response, generally people have looked at the CAPS theorem and said, I'll have to sacrifice consistency because I need such snappy response. So what we're going to see is that with ISIS, you can get that trade-off to run in different ways, and you can tune them to your application so that you can build a more critical application that needs consistency and still get very high levels of performance out of it, although you may find that you do sacrifice some degree, for example, of partition tolerance. And take the example of my air traffic control system with the split brain. We don't always want availability and partition tolerance. The air traffic system needs consistency even if the blues can run and the pinks have to be shut down. So yeah, it's a different trade-off. So ISIS comes to the rescue in such settings. 
what its job is basically is to make your job easier as a developer. Uh, as I've mentioned, it has a formal model based on protocols we can express mathematically and we can prove things about it. And actually, it's a set of modules, each of which embodies some of these kinds of complex protocols. It's also implemented to be fast, reasonably easy to use. We want it to be appealing. We want you to look at this and say, you know, I'd rather use this system than build something like this on my own. And we want to give you such good performance, even under difficult conditions, that will outdo what you could have gotten on your own easily in any case. Uh, and of course that forces us to anticipate many styles of use and it makes this MOOC a little more complicated than it would be otherwise. So here's an example of typical code written in ISIS. And I'm just going to run through the code uh, top to bottom, chunk by chunk, and try to show you what it's doing. Now remember, in your mind, you've got to go back to that picture of the individual program that was running normally, and then we ran more copies of it elsewhere. And there wasn't any magic, no shared state magically being... Everything is done by explicitly passing messages, okay? So this program... What it does is it gets to a point where it decides to create a group to share some data. And it's going to create a group and call this group my group. And when you say group G equals a new my group, what's happening is that you're asking ISIS to create a sharing context. Uh, G is going to be your portal into it. Very often, this would happen inside a class of your own, and we'd be creating a group, uh, an object of your own. And so you very often have an application object with its own state, and as a counterpart, you've got this ISIS object, which represents the sort of replicated state. Okay, G is our way into it. And now what we're going to do here, this particular application object has application state. So you see this uh, dictionary we've created of values? This is a, a C-sharp construct. Uh, actually, uh, Java has something very similar, but it's a little uh, uglier to use. Uh, but in general, uh, this notion of a list of things which have keys and values shows up in almost every language today. You see it in C++ and C and, and, and you name it. Um, and so, so a dictionary is a list of key value items that has a very rapid way to access the items using hashing. This particular dictionary, the, ha the key is a string, and uh, you can see that the value here is a double. All right? And um, the name of the variable is, var is values, and then I, I instantiate it. And, and so what's going to happen is each program in this group that uses ISIS separately will have gotten to the line where it laid one of these things out, and each one will have its own private, local version of values. Okay. And there's no linkage between them because you can see that the group G doesn't know about values. We haven't tied it together in any way. It's just a variable in the object that also chose to create this other variable, group G. You see? Now, the next thing the program does is it attaches event upcall handlers to this handle G. And so we see g.viewHandlers plus equals a delegate is a way to create an anonymous method, uh, a method just being a function that returns void. This particular function uh, takes a view object as its argument. Later we'll see what a view has in it. But it, it's a way that ISIS notifies you that the membership of a group has changed. And so a view would typically have a view identifier, a list of the membership, who, lo who joined, who left, and it's got some other information in it as well that can be useful. Um, and the particular program prints it out into the console window uh, in the title bar. Okay? And so what will happen here is that this is attaching a method and the method is just sitting there idle. And later, when membership changes in this group, each time a membership change occurs, ISIS will do an upcall to this method and that will notify this application object of a change in the underlying membership. You see this notion of event-driven computing? We're going to see more of that. So here's another example. In this next line, g.handlers of update, first thing to understand is that update is just a small integer uh, and it's been given the name update. I should have had an enumerated type, but I didn't want to make my code more complex than I needed to. But it's a number like 0 or 1 here. 0 for update, maybe 1 for lookup. You can have as many of those as you want, up to I think 128 of them now. And um, what I'm doing is associating an event handler for what the application thinks of as updates 
And this event handler uh, expects to see a string and a double as its arguments. And what it does is it stores the value into the values array. See, remember that the dictionary I created is a key value list. In, in C Sharp, you can treat that just like an array, even though it's really an array list, basically. All right. And so what happens here is that um, we either create or modify an entry associated with string s, and we store the value v into it. All right, so it's acting like an array indexed by strings. And then similarly, the lookup on the next line attaches another handler. And here it expects a string. And this one looks into the value array to see whether we know a value associated with that string. It probably should be checking to see if it's there because it's going to throw an exception if it's not there. And that would crash this program. But I wanted to keep it very simple. Um, and uh, what it then does is it uses a, a reply option that ISIS offers you. And I'll show you how that's used in a second. But this is a way to send a message back to somebody. And it will turn out that the first of these handlers is used to receive multicasts. One guy sends an update to many others. And the second of these handlers is used to handle queries. You send out a question, and you get back a bunch of replies. And g.reply is how the replies are sent back to you. All right. Now, the next thing that this piece of code does is the group member joins the group. So up to this point, the program was doing setup actions, but hadn't actually attached itself to the distributed group. G.join does attach it. And what it does is it checks that the other group members have the same handlers and the same signatures. You can't join if you're not compatible with the group. If you enabled security, which I didn't bother to do here, it would also check that you're using the same security key as everyone else is using. I'm assuming that that's the case. Your join is successful. We won't deal with that now, but this would be a point at which you could make a checkpoint in some existing member and load that checkpoint in this joining member to initialize uh, the values array. But we'll worry about that later. Now I can do sends. Here's an ordered send, which is one of a couple of I ISIS multicast primitives. Ordered send means that even if concurrent ordered sends are done by lots of members of a group, Everyone sees them arrive in the identical order. And what do these ordered sends do? In this particular case, the ordered send uh, invokes the update event handler and passes in a string and a double. And you saw earlier that that was the expected type signature. And so a message goes to that handler, and it gets updates. Okay, And each of the four copies, or five, or 20, or two, however many members happen to be in the group, separately and in parallel, gets invoked. And each one of them will separately apply that update to its version of the values array, you see? And it's a sort of a one-to-many action. So we would think of that as an arrow going out to the other members of the group. You didn't have to say who's in the group because ISIS figures that out for you. It does a little interlock. That may take a little time. So g.ordered send might take a while to execute, but generally these operations are extremely fast. You should be thinking in terms of tens or hundreds per, per millisecond even. Okay, so you can really do a lot of them. All right. Now, I want you to, 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 to again think about this distinction between local data and magically replicated distributed data. Because every time people have trouble with the picture I've shown you, it's because somehow they assumed that this values object had become magically distributed. And I just want to emphasize that each program instance has its very own version of that values dictionary. And what's keeping them consistent is simply that we're going to initialize them the same way, and then we're going to apply the same updates in the same order. Okay. So values is a local variable. It just happens to have the same name in all of the program instances. It didn't really have to. Different programs can join the same group if they're compatible. Um, they just have to do something compatible. This is a generic type, by the way. If you're not familiar with these, I know some people aren't, I'll just really quickly explain what it is. So a generic type is simply a type in which other types are provided as parameters. So when I say dictionary string double in angle braces, what that's saying is that it's a dictionary type. And a dictionary type in C Sharp is a key value storage list. Um, each element on the list has a key and a value. And here what I'm doing is saying that the key is of string type and the value is of double type. You could have put almost anything you like in for the key and the value. You could actually have put another dictionary in, but that gets a little mind-bending if you go down that route. Um, and uh, the name of the value uh, variable is values here. All right, and, uh, and so now we go back to our picture, and we can see how ISIS is making your life a lot simpler because although this code is really simple, think of all the questions ISIS is grappling with that we talked about. 
that you're not grappling with by virtue of using the library. You're not worried about who's in the group right now. ISIS had to figure that out for you. You're not worried about how to get these messages into order if they were sent concurrently. ISIS is dealing with that for you. You don't have to worry about messages being dropped and retransmitted. You don't have to worry about flow control. You don't have to worry about fragmenting big messages into small ones. So here's, here's how the query uh, is done. It really starts with a multicast. So when you do a query, you can see that the first part of the query is an indication of how many answers you're expecting back. In some cases, you talk to a whole group, but you want one answer. Sometimes maybe you want three answers, even if the group has 1,000 members. This particular query is asking for members, for all the members to reply. And so this is the way that the caller signals to ISIS how many answers to wait for. Now, because it's a variable number, we have to have the ability to have a list of answers. And that's why we have a list of doubles shown here. G.reply can have one or more arguments. And each one of those arguments will, will turn into a value in the reply list. OK, so the result list here is a list of doubles because we're only passing one thing back. If hypothetically, if I was passing back, um, I don't know, a number, an account, an int, then I would have two lists a list of doubles and maybe a list of ins. And then instead of saying result list, it would be like result D list, result I list. And you could have as many of those as you want. And the replies have to match up with the list of replies that come back, you see? And how does ISIS tell where the multicast part of the query, which sends the question out, ends, and where the lists of replies start? That's what this EOL thing is. It's a special object, an instance of something ISIS calls an end of list object, EOL. I allocated one somewhere and kept it, kept it. And ISIS is looking for something of type EOL list that delimits between the end of the multicast request and the beginning of the result lists. So that's how that's working. And what's going to happen now is that in our group, we're going to send out a request, which is going to go to all the group members. And then they're all going to reply. And we're going to take the replies and, and maybe combine them somehow and send them back to, to Harry here. It's a chance for parallelism, although the particular little fragment of code I've showed you doesn't use that very well. But later, we'll be seeing how to take advantage of it. So maybe I'm looking up Harry in the phone book. Well, that's a pain, because looking for every entry in the phone book that has the word Harry in it, you'd have to go page by page scanning for Harry's. Right? If you want to do that fast, the idea of having the phone book spread over 100 computers, each one of them does one one hundredth of the pages, that would be very fast and very appealing. And that's the kind of parallelism ISIS is offering you if you wanted to exploit it. We'll see how to do that in a little while in a demo I'm going to do for you. But in any case, it would be the structure that we looked at here. And then you take the different answers you got, you'd combine them, and you'd have the full list of everybody named Harry that you can find in the Ithaca phone book. So ISIS is making your list, your job kind of easier for that, too, because as you can see, we send out this query. Uh, we'll talk about the difference between query, ordered query, and some other cases. You may have noticed that it switches back and forth on these slides. It's really because I'm being inconsistent, but I'm going to tell you how to make that choice in a little bit. Um, and so what we do here is we're doing an ordered send because of the possibility of concurrent updates, and we're doing an ordered query because we want to make sure that we see those lists in the same instant, in the same consistent state. And then what happens is everybody is sending back their personal version of the reply. Now, it happens in this particular case. They all had the same thing in the values list. And so they all send back the same reply. They look up Harry and see if they have a value for it, and they send that value back. And as I said, this code is not really safe because it would throw an exception uh, if they don't have Harry in there. Better code would check and send back zero if they don't have Harry, and otherwise it would send back the Harry entry. And then those results come back, and they accumulate in this thing called result list. And you'll end up with NR. Uh, results. The NR is just an integer that tells you how long the result lists are. You could have just looked at the length of the result list. That would work too. Result list .count. Um, and then you can iterate over it. You can combine them together. Uh, C Sharp actually has a very powerful thing called link built into it, which is specifically for taking lists and combining them using database style queries on them. Very, very nice if uh, you haven't looked at it. All right. So the ordered send here told ISIS which multicast you wanted it to use. And um, that's going to turn out to determine uh, the, the degree of consistency guarantee you get, and also other types of guarantees that ISIS tries to offer for you that have varying costs, and you'd like to try to have the cheapest good enough solution, basically. 
Um, so an RPC is a little bit similar to a query, and everybody's familiar with RPC, and I thought I might just contrast. So with an RPC, you do a remote procedure call, and there's a procedure that takes arguments by value, and the client asks, and you it often can present it as if the procedure was local to the caller, and then he just does a call, and that stub handler packages it in a message, sends it over, it's demarshaled, processed, back comes the reply. And in ISIS, what's happening with a multi-query, um, and ISIS, I should say, has RPCs. You can do that if you prefer. If you have one member, you want to talk to that member. But with this kind of multi-query that we're seeing, ISIS uses a multicast that has some ordering guarantees. Same idea, though. It packages your request, sends a message. They all process in parallel, and they send back the responses. So in this particular case, if the group had N members, you'll get N replies. But in this case, the replies will all be the same, because values always had the same updates applied to it. So all of the N members had the identical thing in it. But we're going to see that built on that pattern, we can do things more elaborately. For example, different group members could look at the membership list of the group, and then they could look up their own what we call rank in it. You could say, well, I'm the leader in the group. I have rank zero. Somebody else could say, I'm rank three. And then because they're getting consistent states but different rank numbers, they could do different tasks, such as counting off by rank within the Ithaca phone book and saying, we've got the same phone book, but I'm rank zero, I'll search page zero. This other guy could say, I'm rank one, I'll search page one. We can turn on security very easily in ISIS. Uh, it's, it's an easy thing to do that even after the fact. People usually tell you design security from the ground up, but ISIS itself is secured from the ground up, and you can enable that feature when you want. This is one way to do it, where uh, I just tell uh, the group to turn on its security feature, and I actually give it the key I'd like it to use. To do that, I'd have to have the key from what's called the credential service. Um, very commonly, you don't know how to get your hands on a key, and ISIS will also fabricate a key for you. But if it does that, the form of security you get is based on user IDs in Windows or Linux. You'll end up with applications under the same user ID are able to join the group and otherwise not. And what's really going on under the surface in that case is ISIS generates the key for you and puts it in a file and sets the file permissions so only the people with that user ID can read the key out of the file and then file system security protects you. So if you've got your own source of keys, your own credential store, you can bring them in here. These have to be what are called AES-256 keys, which means that they are 256-bit random-looking numbers, and anything will work. If you don't have the right key, you can't join the group. And furthermore, uh, without the right key, you won't be able to read the data even on the wire if you were somehow sniffing the wire. You're going to have to make a choice of how strong the ultra multicast primitive to use is. You can always use ordered send like I showed you here. Um, but I will mention that ISIS has other choices available, and we're going to talk about them in a different module of this. They include a, a raw send, which is a lot like uh, UDP multicast. It has a FIFO, meaning uh, TCP style ordering send, where if you send ABC, you're guaranteed that ABC will get uh, delivered in that order. But send doesn't worry about concurrent senders. Ordered send does guarantee uh, things for ordered senders. There's a weird one called causal send. I'll say something about that later, but it's more for academics. Uh, it's kind of fun, though, as a, as a primitive. It's, uh, unfortunately, the implementation in ISIS isn't very fast, so I wouldn't use it unless you're trying to impress your professor. Um, there's something called flush we're going to sometimes have to use with these uh, what are called optimistic delivery cases. And we'll talk about that in a different module. I just mentioned it so that you'll be aware that it's coming up. And these are the cases that are very fast. We also have a version which is much more pessimistic, and you would use it when you need the very, very strongest guarantees. And usually that arises when you're building kind of a critical infrastructure component, and furthermore, when it has a database external to the ISIS group that it's doing updates on and that's been replicated. So that's really a lot of ifs. But if you're building, say, a, a medical records database system, and you plan to replicate the medical database, and you plan to store it outside the group on some other kind of file server. Then you would use uh, primitives that are associated with the uh, family of protocols called the Paxos protocols. And in ISIS, that's called safe send. And in particular, it's called safe send configured to use something called the disk logger. And if you choose that, you get a very, very conservative and somewhat slow solution, but it has every possible guarantee. 
Um, and the reason that we need to even know about that and don't want to just use safe send with the disk logger every single time is because if you did that, if you used Paxos every single time, you really don't get solutions that scale very well or that perform very well. And frankly, they don't perform well enough for cloud uses. So it turns out that this is a, a great set of properties for the most conservative piece of your system, but you generally prefer to be using ordered send combined with this uh, thing called g.flush, which we'll talk about. Um, K is, is kind of a protection level, and it would typically be two or three. So g.ordered send followed by a g.flush at some point is, is a much faster, completely reasonable balance that ISIS offers you. So you can see one thing about programming in a system like ISIS, you end up having to learn how these things work to make choices appropriately. But the positive side is that you can make those choices to match the properties of the system to the needs of your, your application. Uh, so our application was really very simple. It, it didn't show everything. One thing that I didn't show you in that piece of code was state transfer. If you look at this picture, and this is a different form of picture that you'll be seeing in these modules, time here is running from left to right instead of top to bottom. Sometimes I do that because it fits better on my slide. You can see that I've got process P joining, later Q joined, later R joined, and S and T. And when they joined, you see these white arrows inside the blue ovals. Those represent the fact that we had to initialize the joining members uh, so that they'll be in the same state as the group already was in. So for example, the values array may have some stuff in it by the time R and S and T joined. We have to get a copy of what's in the values array to them. So that's done by making a checkpoint. And ISIS uses checkpoints for several things state transfer. So in that case, a checkpoint is made in one of the members, probably P, but you can actually control which member makes the checkpoint. And then it's delivered to the members that want to receive it. In this case, the joiners would be R and S and T, and then they load the checkpoint. And I'll show you, the code looks almost exactly the same as sending a multicast and processing the multicast. The, sent, the checkpoint maker is just a different kind of method, like multicast, and you just put values in it. And the loaders are polymorphic methods, meaning they have sig type signatures. And uh, for each send checkpoint request, a corresponding load checkpoint request will occur for the matching type signature. It looks just the same. And we also store checkpoints into a type of log file to make these groups persistent. So if you're building a group where the group might have run a, a few hours ago, then it shut down completely, and now P restarted it in this picture. In that case, uh, if you're using that feature, P will reload its state out of the checkpoint. And that way, the group remembers its state even when the group isn't running, which is quite useful. Um, so you could remember the state in files of your own or in a database. But another option is that the group itself can remember its state over long periods of time simply by using this checkpointing feature and turning on group persistence. It's really, really simple. Um, various uses for process groups. This is sort of a summary slide. Uh, replicating data we can see now is clearly something we can do. We can replicate information about actions we're performing in the outside world in some way, such as we're in the process of powering up a transformer in the smart power grid, uh, or we're uh, going to give Mrs. Smith uh, an injection of insulin at 10 o'clock, uh, so many units of insulin later we might record into the system. We did that. Um, to ensure that the replicas in a system are configured in the same way, a lot of times configuration parameters in modern computing systems need to be consistent across the machines, otherwise my computer can't manage to talk to this other computer. Maybe the firewall isn't set right. Um, coordinate processing of requests from external clients and load balancing. You could replicate load information using multicast. We can parallelize processing by having each group member do different things, and we can do fault tolerance via a kind of backup. So to summarize then, the package we're going to be learning more about here, ISIS-2, is a library. It's not hard to use, and I'll be showing you in the next module how to load it onto your system and build the same application we just saw. It does the work of creating groups and sending multicasts and ensuring that consistency will be preserved. And the developer just tells it what to do. You think about this parallel application, you make a nice picture of it, and then one by one you take steps which eventually give you a solution. And frankly, in a couple of minutes, we could build applications which are as fancy as the kinds of things I've been talking about. So we'll continue with this in the other modules. And as you'll see, we have a module on the ISIS basics, just talking about groups and so forth. We've got a module on making ordering choices. 
Then there's some modules on special subsystems, one on the locking features of ISIS, one on what's called the distributed hash table options, which have to do with spreading data over large numbers of machines in a big data center. There's a module on uh, file transfer in ISIS, which is a, a feature we've added to handle big data, where you might have large files, gigabytes perhaps, on different nodes and you want to move them around. ISIS can optimize that for you. Um, and then there are going to be some other modules that are concerned with accessing some of those features from a command line. But those are going to be designed so a person wouldn't need to see this full lecture to be able to benefit from them. It'll be oriented towards people who don't program with ISIS, they just use ISIS. And that's going to be coming later. So we'll continue with this later. Let me just